Thank you, Dr. Nigro. It's great to be here in Vancouver. Uh, Any time they come out to the most beautiful city in the world, I welcome it. Uh, and everybody in Edmonton always justifies it by saying, oh, I wouldn't want to live in Vancouver. It rains all the time, so it does rain today. But I think that's a lame excuse for the minus 40 January weather. So today I'd like to talk about urethral stricture disease. And it's really a disease that's really, the management has changed tremendously in the last 10 years. It's tissue transfer techniques and a whole new way of thinking about it has really revolutionized the way we treat strictures. So in terms of an outline of what I'd like to talk about, uh, anatomy always, no one's favorite topic, but applied anatomy is really uh, the crux of how this uh, type of surgery has evolved in the last 10 years. And essentially how to evaluate somebody, it's not that difficult, it's actually quite easy. And we'll do a couple of cases, bulbous urethral stricture, short and long ones, as well as a penile urethral stricture case, and then a posterior urethral disruption. It's not actually a true stricture, but rather a traumatic disruption. So in terms of the penis, we have to discuss the blood supply. Urethra is unique in that it has a dual blood supply. It's not like a kidney and it's segmental. It has two blood supplies. Proxim the common penile artery supplies the blood to the penis. Approximately, there will be the... Uh, let's see if I can... Maybe that was the pointer. Well, there's, there's a uh, bubble urethral artery that supplies the anti-grade blood supply. In a retrograde fashion, the circumflex and dorsal arterial system provide a retrograde blood flow. That's quite critical because you can mobilize the urethra quite aggressively, even transect it and mobilize both ends to still maintain a healthy, robust blood supply. The fasciocutaneous blood supply to the uh, penile skin is completely separate. So the skin in darkos itself is supplied by the external, superficial external pudendal artery, which allows you to, again, aggressively mobilize a paddle of skin quite aggressively on darkos fascia. So urethral stricture, well, We've known for about 50 years there's the scar of urethral epithelium. But really in the last 20 to 30 years we've seen it evolve into also a scar of the underlying corpus spongiosum. Unless that scar of the sponge is addressed, generally stricture uh, treatment will fail. So most strictures, as most people will know, are probably idiopathic, but of course straddle trauma accounts for the majority of them, likely the idiopathic ones as well. Inflammatory strictures, although much less common now with the advent of antibiotics and less gonococcal strictures, DXO does play a big role in inflammatory stricture disease. Pelvic fractures, of course, cause that bubble membranous disruption, as well as is a rare congenital stricture. So in treating stricture disease, we really have to determine several things. One is the length of the stricture, of course, determines our treatment modalities. The location is, of course, critical, as well as the depth and density of the surrounding spongier fibrosis. So the best way to diagnose the urethral stricture isn't to look in and just cut but probably the best thing is to stage it appropriately beforehand. The gold standard has been a retrograde urethrogram, basically placing the patient in an adequate oblique position and still in contrast, usually uh, water-soluble IV contrast, down the urethra in a retrograde fashion. You can generally outline a stricture truly. As long as you get ex contrast past the sphincter, outline some of the prostatic urethra and into the bladder to be sure that there is no proximal disease. In this situation, normal urethra will distend nicely, Abnormal urethra obviously will show the stricture. Avoiding cystic urethrogram can also be a nice adjunctive test, and it will further outline, I guess, the degree of obstruction and how significant uh, it is, as well as, again, proximal defect. Cystoscopy, again, is crucial to make sure that you're not dealing with a scar or spongial fibrosis in the remaining portions of the urethra, which may be normal on cystoscopy. Oh, sorry, on retrograde urethrography. Some other people have used other adjunctive tests. Jack Mackinich has used ultrasound exclusively. However, it doesn't change the management because he'll do his urethrogram first and then prior to performing the surgery that day in the OR under general anesthesia, do the ultrasound. But it's nice that we'll demonstrate the surrounding spongial fibrosis of a stricture rather than just the discrete defect you truly see the spongial fibrosis. His argument is some strictures will have extension of that scar without actually being seen on urethrography. And of course, in the U.S., like everything, they've used MRI to try and stage strictures, which isn't very uh, practically applicable to the, in this scenario, especially in Canada. So when treating a urethral stricture, we have to think, what, which route do we want to choose? Do we want to try and, I guess, manage them with a dilation or a urethrotomy, or do you try to actually cure the disease, <coughs> which reconstructive would come into play, or do you, like often patients will now, have a trial of urethrotomy and then on to the reconstruction if they fail? Some urologists have advocated it's time to abandon the reconstructive ladder and that if somebody has stricture characteristics that would favor reconstruction, just proceed directly to reconstruction. And in fact, it's probably actually more cost effective. So there was a case. He's a 23-year-old guy who was uh, having some beer with his friends one Saturday night. 
and decided I can't urinate all in the middle of the night and went into urinary retention. So as you can see, he had a retrograde urethrogram here, which demonstrates, not clearly, but nicely, a uh, obvious abnormality in the proximal bulbous urethra, probably about a centimeter. And the voiding stone definitely confirms that this patient does have a high grade obstruction, two centimeters in length. What would you guess the etiology of this? It's probably a straddle injury of the child that he didn't recall. The majority of these are. And it's implication immediately under the pubic synthesis would obviously a prime location for those injuries. So in terms of treating this relatively short segment urethral stricture, there's several options. One, I think the standard treatment most people would consider is a direct division internal urethrotomy, or DVIU. Some would consider the urolum endoprosthesis, and others would consider reconstruction by stricture excision and primary anastomosis. So offhand, what would the majority of people consider in this guy's situation? So who, who would try a DVIU initially? Now, I think the majority of people right now would. Who would try to go with an urolum in this patient? Good, I hear that. And re who would try to attempt a primary urethral reconstruction? Eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. So that's what most people do. So a DVIU is obviously the first treatment option, and has been considered the standard treatment since about the mid 1970s. And really, that's when I think it, the impetus for urethral reconstruction has dropped off dramatically since this has been utilized as a widespread means of treating strictures. So 20 years later, we're realizing what the long term results are, so some of the thoughts have changed. But essentially, most people I don't know how to do it. It's an incision or ablation of the stricture, generally at the 12 o'clock position. It's not an ideal position because 12 o'clock in the bulbous urethra is where it's the most narrow, the less distance between the urethral lumen and outside of the sponge. So if you're aggressive, you can quite easily get outside the, uh, of the urethral lumen and you can cause a hematoma and the theoretical risk of erectile dysfunction. Some people have argued maybe the 3 and 9 o'clock positions would be, a, would be a better place to incise. What it boils down to is healing by secondary intention. As soon as you cut a stricture, the race is on between wound contracture and epithelialization. So the race is on. If it epithelializes before it contracts, obviously it will stay open. And oftentimes, if it doesn't, the scar does reform. Complications? In the literature, I uh, try to look at, for a project I've done, all the complications in the, in the large series. So it's not a benign procedure, I discovered. About 10% of people will have some sort of infective symptom or fever after the procedure. 6% will have some swelling and hematoma, and about 1%, very low, or less than 1%, can have a theoretical risk of ED. And of course, core D's, they have an excessive, extensive stricture with a lot of uh, scarring. So the long-term success of GDIU, and this is a mini meta-analysis I tried to do, looking at the five series long-term follow-up in the literature, and we, we, we combine them all doing pooled averages, about 27% long-term success rate for a two centimeter or less bulbous urethral stricture. So this isn't obviously an ideal procedure, and a lot of patients will relapse and require further treatment. Uh, several studies have looked at the effect of prolonged catheterization, meaning if you leave a catheter in for anywhere from 24 to hours to seven days, it doesn't affect the stricture outcome. And generally, no, because once you remove it, then the race is still on between contraction and epithelialization. So about a 27% long-term success rate, meaning 73% will require further intervention, repeat your erythrotomy or other treatment options. How do you define success? Uh, no, no further episodes of retention. So not really just low range? Or Generally not. And these studies are people who have significant, present with significant voting difficulties requiring further intervention. Do you think any cells go into retention? Is there a failure? Well, high post order schedule is severe obstructive symptoms. Preempting uh, retention. Yeah, they, these, these, this is only five that had actually strong follow up, greater than eighty percent patients, you know, recouped in there. Yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, yeah, they're great. And some were randomized, uh, particularly uh, pain from South Africa. So these are the best long term data we can. N numerous series early on would comment on fifty patients, follow up nine months. I mean, I don't think for an effectivity for renal cell carcinoma or some other cancer technique you claim success under a year. So it, it, was, it was difficult, and that fueled that whole enthusiasm for us. It's so much easier to do. And I think there's been a little bit of selective blindness over the last you know, 20, 30 years. 
Yeah, generally. I think that your percentage of people that come back, it is a very, there is a referral kind of, the percentage of people that come back to the U.S. neurology, the election price of that. Yeah. They never come back if they're, they're good. Unless you have you perfectly you outlined. You've done two or three times and wondered, you should I do you should have been back here. But awesome. it's not as bad as that. Yeah. It all depends on stricter characteristics yeah. and how it's done. Yeah. Because obviously some strictures are very thin, minimal fungal fibrosis, and those are the ones that are likely amenable to this. So, the direct visionary strategy for a scar with significant, you know, significant fungal fibrosis, long term success is poor. Multiple urethrotomies over several series, uh, Panzadoro and Emiliasi showed this brilliantly, that multiple urethrotomies do not achieve cure. Two, three, after that, there will be no chance of success. It's a palliative procedure. Generally, DVIU should be reserved for those with short segment bulbous urethral strictures with minimal fungal fibrosis. Those people can be amenable to a, a DVIU, but generally, if there's a significant scar, significant fungal fibrosis, the more majority will fail. Are you doing ultrasound and all no, just your, it's retrograde urethrogram, boarding study, and then flexible yeah, system. Yeah, it's GDA is kind of a gestalt where you, with the cystoscopy you look in and correlate it with the urethrogram. The ultrasound is, that Magnus is using an adjunctive test. He's never definitively shown that you'll detect longer stricture segments. Uh, than, and for when you do reconstruction, you always uh, have to... I wouldn't know how to say Well, generally... Yeah, I don't know the length of it. Correct. Yeah, it's definitely on cystoscopy. The uh, minimal fungal fibrosis will be more of a filmy structure. There won't be that thick, dense area, white appearance on cystoscopy that you generally see. And with your ethergram, you see how it'll rapidly taper to a nice, discrete structure. That's minimal fungal fibrosis. If it's more of a wide caliber or regular leading up to it, that whole area is fungal fibrotic as well. Oops, sorry, this got removed. So, sorry, this slide was supposed to be at the beginning, but it got moved. So, this is the applied anatomy, the five segments of the urethra, fossa navicularis, penile urethra, bulbous urethra, of course, membranous and prostatic. The so next option would be the urolumen endoprosthesis, which really has some limited application. It's a super braided mesh cylinder, which, of course, expands in situ. Its indication is a short segment stricture. It's basically implanted after DVIU or dilation. It has to be about 28 French, otherwise, and planning it is a contraindication. Epithelialization at about occurs in most people about 90% at between 6 and 12 months. Well, the list of con contraindications is, is pretty hefty. There's those with penile and, penile and meatal strictures. Essentially, they'll have a lot of pain, some erectile discomfort if it's placed in the penile urethra. You can't dilate the stricture greater than 26 French prior to placing it. That's a contraindication. Active infection, you think you're going to instrument them in the future, a relative contraindication. Strictures at the sphincter, obviously you can't place a ear loom there, so be incontinent, or have a lot of irritated voiding symptoms. People with a lot of uh, infection or perineal fistula, of course children, prior skin transfer to the urethra, and of course a posterior urethral disruption. So a hefty list of contraindications. The outcomes are basically best looked at in terms of applying it to North America in the ear loom uh, North American study. 175 patients, symptomatically they were improved, 23 patients required multiple stents, and 26 patients had stricture recurrence requiring intervention. They had some complications, mostly post void dribbling, hematuria, and some erectile pain. Now, the problem with urolume wasn't so much the successes, but was the failures. Generally, when a stricture recurs within the urolume, that whole segment of urethra is excised. The epithelium is lost. And these patients require complete urethral excision involving that segment and a circumferential reconstruction, which is significant because you just can't turn a tube uh, graft into a tube and just place it, you have to on So it requires two tissue sources to reconstruct these people. So even the companies come out now and said patients older than 55 years with coexisting mental health conditions that precur them or limit them from having a proper surgery uh, would be the patients that could have a urolum stent. But rather, so someone who's old, too old to have a surgery, too, too uh, disabled, a urolum can be placed. But generally, younger patients that are healthier should have a consideration of urethral reconstruction in this case of the short segment stricture. If they failed urethrotomy, or if you, if you feel that <laughs> they would be best served with this immediately, you can perform uh, reconstruction. And generally, with a short stricture, they're amenable to stricture excision and a primary anastomosis. There's enough play in the urethra, you're going to dissection, and enough tricks such as dividing into cavernosal space, you can get an end-to-end anastomosis. Generally, you need to avoid instrumentation three months in these patients. 
prior to instrumentation to get a true assessment of the stricture intraoperatively. And if they go into retention, they're best over the supercubic catheter prior to surgery rather than a dilation immediately before. To do this, patients are placed in the exaggerated lithotomy position. It's important to acquire both hip or back problems in the office, and I always give them a trial of positioning to make sure they don't have any paresthesias or abnormal discomfort. It's generally that's an adequate screening test. It gives a piriformis syndrome where the peroneal nerve can actually be placed out normally and they can get tingling and pain. If they're placed in the exaggerated lithotomy position for a prolonged period of time, they can get some actually permanent neuropraxia. And generally, I quote patients according to the literature, about 15% rate of transient peroneal nerve uh, neuropraxia. So the tingling in the dorsum of the foot. But generally that will almost always resolve in about 48 hours. Retractor I use is, of course, training with Jerry Jordan. I use the Jordan Perineal Book Walter. It's a modified book walter that attaches to the bed uh, and gives a excellent exposure to the perineum. It's a speci specifically in patients who are hefty and have a very thick perineum. It's indispensable. So the first step in performing excision of primary anastomosis is always you make a perineal incision. I prefer a lambda-shaped incision based on the perineum, just, uh, just medial to the ischial tuberosities. Dissect through collies fashion subcutaneous tissue down to the level of the ischial cavernosis muscle. Some people also call it the bulbospongiosis muscle. Transect the muscle in the midline, obviously. The next step is to mobilize the bulb. And this is where you get a lot of your mobility in urethra. You transect the urethra and the muscle, uh, you use bipolar electrocautery for hemostasis away from the perineal body. And you can mobilize the entire ball, which gives you that one to two centimeters of mobility to achieve your end to end anastomosis. Yeah. It generally, once you get around the ball, and then it does start to curve up, so then you're actually working down and then back up. Yeah. yeah. Way more horizontal Initially, once you get the sponge mobilized off the perineal body, then it's an upward yeah. motion. Yeah. So there's a fair bit of dissection to be done to mobilize the bulb. In the extension, uh, the divine center, there's 200 patients. Uh, three patients had erectile dysfunction after. And those, those are identified as patients who had a big straddle injury and a lot of fibrosis. So about 1.5% one, one rate of erectile dysfunction. So a schematic, basically, the technique is you completely excise this area of fibrotic urethra, spatulate it to about 28 French, and then attention free anastomosis using absorbable suture, of course, epithelia to epithelium, tension free, all those principles of a urologic anastomosis. Supercubic catheter, I generally use, and it's the stenting urethral catheter that is plugged. If the catheter gets removed or somehow falls out, which somehow catheters do in the third or fourth postoperative day, there's no concern. The supercubic catheter is the drainage and at some point, they'll, they may be okay with just a supercubic catheter, or they can have a small lumen catheter placed. Generally, put a small closed suction drain around the bulb on the anastomosis for 48 hours. Patients are discharged the afternoon of postoperative day two. So the results are basically looking at the largest series of EP in the literature at the Divine Center. There's 198 patients, all had follow-up greater than four years. Stricture length was an average of about 1.8 centimeters, but up to four centimeters could be treated using extenuating circumstances. 98% sure. So no patients of those 98% required further instrumentation. And there's a less than 2% rate of erectile dysfunction and a 1% rate of infection and wound complications. How many stretches do you do a week? Stretch myself? At the divine center. At the divine center? We, Jordan did about three to four. And he's away a lot, so on average. And he did, he did the most of them down there now? Yeah, he would do most of the Do you have plastics involved? No, never. We harvest harvest your own grass. And so, so, no, no, no. She does not. Any of the foul of plastic is okay. going on. So long-term success, well, are these results transferable and are they applicable to other centers? Well, it turns out, yeah. Looking at five series with lot from larger centers with long-term follow-up, it works out to the 90% long-term, 96% long-term success rate. So excellent success for these short segment urethral strictures. So the conclusion is, many consider excision of primary anastomosis the gold standard for the short segment bulbous urethral stricture. Because of its high success rate, low complication rate, it's a durable, and it's applicable to all, all centers, and really generally no repeat procedures are required for the rest of the patient's life. This, this technique of excision can also be used as part of a more extensive reconstruction technique, which I'll show you shortly. 
So to this patient, is the second case, this is another young patient who developed urinary retention and had, was found out of stricture and had a history of two urethrotomies and, of course, failed. This is where urethra gun comes into play. This actually doesn't show it well, but he has, of course, a very short segment stricture that's obstructing, a wide dilated segment, and then another proximal stricture. On cystoscopy, this, this is all dense spongial fibrotic scar. If you just excise this segment, and it's the most that, that these patients would, would fail. So he's a five centimeter stricture. He's not a candidate for all primary excision and reanastomosis. There's not enough length in the urethra. The DVIU in this patient has been shown to have minimal efficacy, still recurrent, less than 5% success rate. So this is a patient who requires tissue transfer techniques. And basically, this is applicable when a patient has a stricture long enough, too long, for a primary anastomosis. And it's generally best employed as an on-lay procedure. And the, the new thought over the last, I guess, three years now is this technique of augmented anastomosis. You excise the worst, most obliterative segment, one to two centimeters of it, create a, a floor strip, and then onlay the remaining portion of the stricture. Always the argument is flat versus graft. And there's been a recent resurgence in the graft thanks to the Germans and their use of the buccal mucosal graft over the last 10 years. So graft is essentially a tissue that's taken, dismembered, and placed on a separate graft bed. In contrast, a flat is a tissue that has its preserved blood supply, so obviously no take is required. Grafts are readily available in most patients. Flaps are not always available, such as someone's had previous surgery or no penile skin redundancy. A graft is generally easy to harvest, quick. A flap does take a significant amount of dissection. A graft usually concealed scar, but unfortunately a flap usually is harvested from always an external area and is usually a visible scar. So, in terms of thinking about what kind of graft you would use in urology, specifically reconstructive urology, the buccal mucosal graft has really become a mainstay. Uh, it's, it's a full thickness graft. In addition, sometimes there is still a place for full thickness skin, split thickness skin, occasionally bladder epithelium, and rarely the wolf graft, which Tony Mundy in England has used quite extensively. In terms of flap, what penile, or flap, the penile skin on the flap is by far and away the most common flap used in urethral reconstruction. And occasionally, a hairless scrotal island will be employed as well. So these graphs are past that? I, yeah, based on the principle of patch graph. So whenever using a graph, I'd like to discuss first with regard to this five centimeter bulbous urethral stricture, a couple considerations. For the first 48 hours, a graph is in suspended animation. This is a process called imbibition, which is floating and absorbing all the nutrients from the surrounding medium. The next 48 hours are inosculation, which is essentially a term for neovascularization. So it's important to have a very well vascularized graph bed for a graph to take. The graft should be immobile. A shearing force will disrupt inosculation and the graft won't take. Hemostasis is a, has to be achieved because a, a hematoma underneath the graft will again result in its death. And antibiotic prophylaxis because infection will again kill the graft. So those principles should be adhered to. So a new concept is the buccal mucosal graft. And Berger, in 1992, a German, applied it to the urethra. Basically, it's a very, it's an excellent choice for urethral reconstruction. Number one, it has a pan-laminar plexus. Generally, skin will have a, a intradermal and subdermal plexus. So there's a plane potentially where a graft take may not be adequate. The buccal graft is pan-laminar and random. So anywhere, as long as you're in the laminar propria, the graft will take. It's a wet graft. And when you think about what the mouth goes through in a day, diet coke, coffee, biting it, salivary enzymes, and brushing your teeth, it's a harsh environment. The skin is used to being bathed, lotions, it's dry, it's just very well attended to. But the urethra is more, more suited to the, to the mouth in a way. It's high osmolality, it's acidic, it's a very caustic environment. So, the buccal graft seems ideally suited to the urethra. Again, the buccal graft in most people is readily available, and it's a very easy graft to handle. So, how is it harvested? You see, as you're all, this girl says, you're all just up more than anything, even though, no matter, you, you do all kinds of crazy things that, that most people would be uh, astonished by. But, the graft is usually taken, of course, from the inside of the cheek. The mark stents in the duct, because that's obviously the main drainage for the parotid glands, which can result in a post op parotiditis and complications from that. You usually outline a 2.5 centimeter by 6 centimeter segment on each cheek. Put the patients in the phlebotomy after the graft harvest. Donor sites can be harvested, can be closed primarily, generally, but if you can't, you can leave them open. There's no problem with that. It's important to clean and thin the graft down to that white laminopropria, and then once the harvest is done, 
repropagate the perineum and start the urethral dissection. Hemostasis in the mouth, is, a bipolar cautery works very well for that. So, another new concept. So the first one is the buccal graft. The second one is the dorsal onlay. And this was initially described by Monsieur many years ago where he just opened the urethra dorsally and placed it on the tunica albuginea directly. However, granulation tissue and post op stricture formation was a problem. So Barbagli, an Italian, a bit of a salesman, discovered uh, placing a graft dorsally as opposed to ventrally. And he described it as improved graft fixation, better blood supply from the ventral urethra rather than if you incise it dorsally, there's less sponge tissue to go through and you preserve some blood supply. There's a decreased incidence of saculation and decreased stricture recurrence. And Anthony Mundy has uh, expressed uh, these points as well in a, in a study. So the general schematic technique is you mobilize the entire bulbous urethra. This is a simple one. They someone that has a wide caliber stricture with no severe obliterative segments. The urethrotomy is performed dorsally to about 28 French. The buccal graft is quilted onto the corporal body dorsally, and then the urethra can be onlaid onto that graft. So it's important to maintain it, make sure it is watertight. And here's a it's described, as I said before, a simple onlay. Here's what, here's a schematically the dorsal onlay and the graft stone. Here's an intraoperative photo I took of the buccal graft stone onto the uh, erectile body dorsally, and the graft saturated so it still stays to expose it, and it'll be sewn onto that with the catheter in place. Do you mesh the graft or make uh, You know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I don't think it's critical in the buccal mucosal graft. The graft take is so robust, and generally that plane in the, uh, between the urethra and the, and the corporal body, it's pretty avascular. There's usually a few bleeders, and hemostasis is usually excellent. So, matching is really, you don't want to get any subgraft collection and, and have that poor taste. But, sometimes they do some of it. So, it's not critical in the muscle graft. Where do you put the urethra? Where do you put the hmm? okay. Well, this is a different type. This is all uh, similar. Here's another intro, some more intraoperative photos. This is, this is the bulbous urethra, the distal portion, the proximal is down here. So I've excised the urethra at that point. And you can see this very white scarred lumen. That's an obliterative segment. So that segment, one centimeter or so, is excised completely. That area is spatulated distally into healthy tissue, approximately of as well into healthy tissue. The graft is sewn onto the corporal body dorsally and spread thick and quilted. And then what happens is you create a floor strip between this end and this end because all this segment of urethra here and here it's still abnormal. Okay. But there is, so there is a, a part of the catheter is still exposed. Uh, no, it will be sewn. And what happens is you create a floor strip here of sutures. The catheter is passed all the way through. And this side is anastomal to this margin of the buccal graft. And as well, conversely on the other side, it's sewn in. So it's a watertight anastomosis on weight. So it's made twice as wide, essentially, in this fashion. Is that two buccal grafts there? That's just one. one. Just one graft. About, I think it's about five centimeter graft. So the advantages of the dorsal runway uh, are basically the ventral patch graft has outward pressures with no support or back for that graft. So there's a theoretical risk, it turns out it probably does translate into a real risk, of saculation long term from that pressure. Dorsally, it's placed, so it's buttressed by these corporal bodies with less incidence of saculation. And you get a better spread fix of the graft. Some would argue the take may not be as robust, but the buccal graft takes so well in almost all circumstances. Postoperatively, I put a suction drain adjacent to the bulb, avoiding trial with contrast for about 28 days. Uh, I may stop doing this because everybody looks so good now. <laughs> Routine cysto at six months, and that's probably the best indicator of success. The urine flows, the bladder can compensate quite well. Urethrography is generally not as accurate in looking at post-op patients. If they're open at six months, it's a good time that they'll be open uh, uh, indefinitely. Then after that, I follow up based on obstructive symptoms or other findings like infection. So does this translate into excellent success? Well, in the four series so far in the literature that have followed people about four to five years, success rate turns out is excellent. Usually with skin in the urethra, there will be an attrition rate after about four years, about two to three percent per year. So long term, the urethral reconstruction using skin, will the success rate will decline. So probably long term with the flap, and Anthony Mundy has shown this nicely, that probably it will drop down to 40, 50 percent success by about 10 to 15 years. These series are at least out to seven, the majority of these patients, and uh, an excellent success rate. So what we can say about the treating a longer segment bulbous urethral stricture, 
using the blocking mucosal graft and dorsal armory approach, excellent results so far in the medium term. The attrition rate will probably be expected, however, I, most reconstructive urologists now feel with longer follow-up, this will become the gold standard treatment of choice for the longer segment, baldus urethral stricture. In terms of other tissue transfer uh, techniques, you can also consider the penile flap for a patient like this. And this is described in 1984, so just 20, less than 20 years ago, by a, a, a physician named Dr. Quarty in Nigeria. And basically, you base a skin island on darto fascia, the axial blood supply is the superficial external pedendal artery, and the skin is basically the passenger on this darto blood supply. And the flap is very useful when infection or extensive fibrosis is present that might limit your graft take. So rather than providing intraoperative photos, this is Cordy's original uh, description, where you can outline your flap, in this case it's a longitudinal penile island flap, in size down to dartos and down to box layer, and clean the dartos flap completely off of box. So you have a complete intact dartos blood supply and you see your vessels from the superficial external pudendal artery. Then you can outline your flap, making a very superficial incision into the skin edge, and mobilize skin off of dartos. So this, this skin will base, be based on its own random dermal blood supply. This dartos pedicle will supply this island of skin with it with vascularity. Then this can be transposed with after dissection uh, essentially all the way to the prostatic apex. If you dissect all the way down to the base of the penis, darko's fascia, that pedicle is highly mobile. It can be mobilized to the tip almost through all the way down to the prostatic apex. So when I consider a flap, well probably in somebody like this patient is again a young patient, numerous urethotomies, multiple, numerous urethotomies, has a 10 centimeter bulbous urethral stricture. So when considering a flap, one should consider three characteristics primarily. Number one, the physical characteristics. It should be non hirsute and should be very thin. In terms of the vascular tree, you generally want an actual blood supply, so very predictable blood supply. In terms of mechanics, well, it's how you elevate the flap. If someone has a lot of dorsal penile skin redundancy, the transverse flap is optimal. If someone has ventral redundancy, a longitudinal flap may be adequate, and if it's just some general redundancy, I mean, most people also in general use a circumferential penile island flap. So in this situation, you can outline a longitudinal flap or a circular island flap, mobilize dartos, elevate the skin pedicle, transpose it down to your perineum, to that plane between the uh, skin and dartos. Again, this technique of dorsal omni and circular excision. Identify your urethra, you know ahead of time, transect it, excise the worst segment, spatulate dorsally, and the flap can be placed instead of a graft on the dorsal aspect, it makes all the anastomosis. So again, flap, replace dorsally, the anastomosis is complete. So another schematic of this is, this would be your worst segment, which would be its size. This is still subject of fibrotic and stricture. So you have a spatulation into this tissue, spatulation all the way into this tissue. Flap is on made dorsally, the force strip is created, the worst segment is excised here. So you have a onlay of the most wide caliber fibrotic disease. So a stricture, again, another caveat to, uh, to, to mention here as we lead into the penile urethral stricture, is balanitis erotica obliterans. Now, this is, of course, an idiopathic inflammatory condition of penile skin, common in childhood, especially in circumcision uh, specimens, but this does cause urethral strictures. In women, it can cause cancer, and men, it's only anecdotally linked to screen cell carcinoma. Histology, hyperkeratosis, and epidermis, what gives a homoge homogeneous appearance of the dermis, and it will be this subdermal infiltrate. There's a classic finding, not a very good photo, but someone with a meatal stenosis. I would say beware of this because people often get the meatal stenosis treated, however, they can have much higher grade, longer segment friction disease associated with this. This is likely due to the meatal obstruction, of then high pressure and extravasation into the glands of the tray, small microabscess formation, and then this march of the stricture completely down the urethra. So here is what this patient can look like. Here's the urethra gram. So here's the tip of the penis, and here's the penile urethra. This is someone who's had no previous instrumentation, but this is an exceptionally long segment urethral stricture down to about the mid bulbous urethra. So this is inflammatory. Obviously, this is not amenable to urethotomy or excision of primary anastomosis. The patient does require reconstruction. The argument is, is that done in one stage versus two? 
So a one stage, which is option described by Orandi in his flat, that you incise the entire stricture after degloving the penis, spatulate it dorsally into healthy tissue, and then onlay a local penile island flap eventually onto this tissue. So it gives a nice post-operative result. The argument is, is this a long-term success? Because again, it's the most substantial penile skin can be closed. Post-operatively, well, the urethral stent, again, a supercubic catheter, small suction drain, antibiotics for 48 hours. It's important to suppress erections in these patients in that, obviously, tension on this anastomosis is not ideal. You usually get a regimen of Valium uh, at bedtime to try and prevent nocturnal erections or at least reduce the severity. Complications, fistula, of course, anytime you operate on the penile urethra, skin loss sometimes from the dermal plexus on the skin not surviving. Generally, about 88 to 90 percent success rate, relatively short term, in this scar, traumatic strictures. However, BXO, like this patient, is a whole other entity. The second option is a staged urethral reconstruction for this patient. This is indicated generally in patients who have a severely long obliterated segment, panurethral stricture, associated fistula with a lot of infection previously, or insufficient penile or donor, donor skin otherwise. This was initially described in the 1950s by Johansson. And this was, of course, his first stage was spatulating the urethra, marsupializing it. The second stage was incorporation of adjacent perineal or penile tissue. This had a lot of complications and didn't work well. Hair growth, calculi formation, and chronic urinary tract infections have plagued these patients. And generally, the stricture will recur and the success rate was low. And then along came the urethrotomy and everybody abandoned this technique. Well, however, contemporary use has shown that free graft use a stage reconstruction can still be performed successfully. So why would you do a stage reconstruction in a patient who had a severely obliterated segment or entire involved your, your completely obliterated urethra? Generally, if you turn a graft or flap into a tube, you get about a 55% long-term success rate. If you onlay, you generally enjoy about a 97% success rate, incomparable stricture. So Tony Mundy nicely described that you avoid tubing grafts and flaps if you can in any way Avoid it, you should. This was needed just one stage. But it's, a, it's a, a showing that a tube graft was obviously vastly inferior to an onlay technique in terms of reconstruction. So here's a stage reconstruction. Again, urethra is spatulated, marsupialized. The honest urethra is here. And then you bring a skin graft in onto the transposed darkos for take. Now these are Schreider's original, photo, uh, original displays. These are some of the photographs from the Divine Center. So the graft is placed, usually matched, it's allowed to take. You can also use buckle grafts at this picture. In this length, you can use a buckle graft as well on either side. Patients have a post-op bolster. They wait about six to 12 months for this graft to become well healed and supple. And then they avoid Curtis urethrostomy for those six months. And then they can elect to go on to the second stage. About 13% elect this to keep voiding through the urethrostomy. And that's the patient population you're dealing with. These are long strictures. They've been through numerous uh, t uh, attempts at, at fi being fixed. So they're happy just urinating, trouble-free. So said about 15, 13 to 15% will just stay with the first stage and not go on to the second stage. Schematic of the second stage is you would size and create a new neo-urethra, about 28 French width. You can tubularize it. That's immobilizing laterally. And generally, at the Divine Center, what we've done is mobilize tunica dartos up over this uh, uh, reconstruction. And it reduces the urethral fistula rate from about 30% to about 5%. So stage urethral reconstruction has a pretty good success, about 82%. You have to ensure that the urethrostomy is patent before tubularizing. Avoid and... Uh, Avoid post-void uh, urethrocutaneous post-op urethrocutaneous fistula is generally by transposing some sort of tissue. Tunica dartos is generally available. So it's not a panacea, but it's a very useful rescue operation for someone who's had long strictures, such as a penile urethral stricture, who's been through a lot of procedures previously. So our current concept is those long segment strictures from BXO, how are they best treated? Anthony Mundy put it very nicely when he showed his outcomes of a one-stage skin transfer and a two-stage uh, procedure. The success rate of BXO with the one stage was zero. So it was pretty dramatic. We were working on 87% with the stage technique. So the current standard is, for someone with BXO and a penile urethral stricture, a two-stage free graft 
uh, stage urethroplasty is a treatment of choice. This brings me to my last topic, which is represented as a stricture, but not a true stricture, the posterior urethral disruption. These are generally associated with about 4 to 6% of pelvic fractures, and generally all those are due to motor vehicle accidents. What happens is you usually have an associated vascular injury. A pelvic fracture causes a disruption at the bulbal membranous junction. This pelvis fills with blood, and you get a rostral displacement of the prostatic apex and the membranous urethra. Up. What happens is, the common misconception is that the urethra transpose this way, and displaced this way, but rather it's an upward motion, actually sometimes behind the pubic synthesis. So it's not a true stricture, but rather a displacement. These patients present with suprapubic catheters after having their orthopedic and general surgeries uh, all performed. And it's important to try and save these patients. There's a voiding study, or tended to void, and a retrograde urethrogram done simultaneously. This looks like an exceptionally long defect. Generally, the proper way to stage these patients is an anti-grade cystoscopy and retrograde urethrogram. This is the same patient photographed down under fluoroscopy. So it's about a two to three centimeter displacement. Turner Warwick said this in 1977, and I believe that this is true today, because more of these patients are surviving to hospital and presenting with the strictures, erectile dysfunction, and sometimes incontinence. So this urologist really who bears the burden of these patients in the long term, rather than the short term orthopedic or general surgery injuries. This is really following my last. So our goal is basically a patient with a continent urethra who's avoiding and try to maintain any pre-traumatic sexual potency. 75% will have preoperative erectile dysfunction. There's basically two options in this patient population, open reconstruction or an attempt at delayed endoscopic alignment. Open reconstruction can be achieved almost always in one stage. Again, a perineal incision, mobilization of the urethra completely down to the bulbal membrane junction. The urethra can be transected at that point because the injury, of course, occurs superior to this aspect. Then one will always have to again, transect, divide the intracorporeal space to get that mobility. Be careful of vessels in this area. The dorsal vein can be transected, but sometimes vessels can be displaced and actually the dorsal artery can be in this area to render somebody further impotent or sacrifice your uh, urethral uh, vascularity. Again, here's a pubic synthesis here and a wall of scar. So it's important to dissect as much of that retropubic tissue as you can. If somebody's minimally displaced, you can place it uh, sound through the bladder neck. A lot of people, some people will require an open cystostomy to do this. You can excise your stricture, saturate the apex, and perform an anastomosis. However, in some cases, this is impossible. And here's just, I get another drawing of where the urethral or uh, prostatic apex would be in someone who has a significant displacement. So it's, it's superiorly transposed. So you have a wall of pubic bone here. So about 20% of patients will require an intra, intrapubectomy to excise that entire intrapubis to, to obtain exposure to the prostatic apex. If that doesn't work, because of the proximity, you can reroute a uh, urethra around the corpus plagiosum to achieve about a centimeter extra in length. It would have been, been ligated right in this plane here. That would be all well, I'm still underneath it, behind the pubis, so it's all displaced. Mostly fibrotic because it's been transected and bled already from the injury. So, posterior urethral reconstruction, about 95% one stage perineal approach. 3 to 5% instance of erectile dysfunction new with this, 5% of patients will have core D. So, long term success rate is, is excellent. Failures are probably due to ischemia of the uh, distal urethra because the proximal segment is transected. So some, a new concept, and this is my last thing I want to talk, discuss, is that it's a new concept in vascularity in that patients have a significant devastating injury to the proximal urethral blood supply. Often, the blood supply is, is inadequate. You can do a urethral reconstruction, but you can never achieve success in treating their erectile dysfunction. So if someone has pre-op erectile dysfunction, penile numbness, or known pelvic fracture or embolization of the internal pudendal arteries, some will advocate a duplex Doppler ultrasound of the penis. If there's abnormal arterial parameters go on to angiography, if they have a significant disruption and no collateralization, it would be tended for penile revascularization. So these will always be very select patients, and the revascularization will achieve increased inflow, and you can reestablish erectile function. Not completely, because obviously they probably have a neural injury as well, 
but rather with PDE5 inhibition. So this is a, it's just to rescue these patients who may be condemned to a penile prosthesis, but rather a means of uh, rescuing these patients so they can be treated with oral therapy rather than uh, prosthesis long term. Again, delayed endoscopic repair has been described by some. You have a wall of fibrosis, cut to the light procedure. It is marred with some complications, 30% 30, 30 transfusion, 10% rectal perforation rate. And scripture outcome isn't that great. So most would advocate the delayed perineal approach to reconstructing these patients. So in summary, UVIU has some poor results long term. Repeat urethotomies will not achieve cure. Bulbous urethral strictures, EPA, excision and primary anastomosis is a gold standard for short segments and for the longer segments, the augmented anastomosis with the buccal graft would probably in the next few years be considered the gold standard as well. Penile strictures generally require tissue transfer and in BXO it's best to perform a stage reconstruction using non-genital skin and if posterior disruptions from trauma are generally successfully reconstructed using a perineal approach in one stage. Uh, thank you. minutes for the questions just before we get to the questions. Um, I just wanted to announce that all of our grand rounds will be placed on our website. Uh, Jason Latikos has helped us develop a system here where the PowerPoint presentations and the audio will be on the website for people to review either those who are here want to see our round again or more likely for the people in the community who all need to access and I'll be sending out those to all these to you all just about that. Um, Secondly, next week, Klaus Rover is a visiting professor from uh, Dallas. He's the uh, chairman of Dallas now. And he did expertise in mediation with the first co author of the MCOP study. And following that, two weeks from now, Peter Cardino will be our visiting professor here to speak to us. So we've got three visiting professors in a row. And I'd like to congratulate a very junior visiting professor. Mm -hmm. That's your first visiting professor. Uh, yeah, I guess it will be. Uh, he's got a good career, I think, ahead of him, and Alberta's uh, lucky to have him. Um, he will be spending some time this afternoon with the right time, uh, Chris? Three, Three o'clock, okay. Where will it be? Is it? We'll tell you. Let's have a game. Can you comment on the new diet celebration? You can tell us anything about success rate. Let's assume that you pick a relatively yeah. active location. What percentage of those patients are successful using the agro? Well, this, generally, this, the largest series is 12 patients because these are obviously a very select population. Pelvic fracture patients who've had bilateral either internal fetal artery embolization or injury with no demonstrated collateralized flow. So, usually the technique is reanastomizing, reanastomizing to the dorsal penile artery using an inferior epigastric as the donor blood supply. It's all done microvascularly to reestablish blood flow. So in terms of outcome, it's basically converting someone who is had no treatment. We usually don't have a trial of you know, either intracavernosal therapy or PDE5 inhibition prior. Of those 12 patients, 11 out of the 12 were rescued with PDE5 inhibitors. So, pretty high success rate when you look at what, you, what your goals are. And that's to convert somebody from having no sex would probably end up having a prosthesis in a young patient versus somebody who's now rescued with oral therapy. The other patient required intracavernosal therapy, but all were having successful erection previously unable to. Right. Years ago we saw uh, not that many four, but at least two to three urethral patterns a week here. Mm. And then they dried up and our theory was that the logging access was dried up. And, mm. and, and so it's, it's interesting that uh, it's, it's Edmonton is that they dried up like they have here. I mean, it's, it's not a common operation. It's not as common as radical prospecting is now, but it's yeah. a very common operation this time. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I've done 30 already, so I haven't done that, and I'm on my wait list is now about four, well, three to have four months, so I just think... It, it already really, 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 really. Yeah, different, oh, yeah, yeah. so, well, 25, 30, yeah, so... And remember, that, then you must be very good, because remember we presented our uh, cash craft release of at the AUA, and we had dismal re re results, and Charlie Bryan got up and he said, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, it's a tech, not technique, it's a technician. <laughs> and so, what I'm saying to you is, is very <laughs> you've got a classic strength. Yeah. But what I'm saying to you is, you've got to be very good at these to get the results. Every, everything closed was less than 30%, everything open was less than 90% of your slides. 
Well, it can be. I think that some of the techniques are, number one, identifying those fungal fibrotic segments as best as you can, especially into that healthy tissue. I know some people I've seen urethroplasties as a resident of medicine that the, the worth of segment is excised and they're re some fibrotic tissue. And that's, that's really w one of the developments is that if you anastomose scar to scar, it will re-scar. And those proximal segments are generally kept open just by sheer pressure, hydrodistension. So that segment looks, looks open, however, it's still fungal fibrotic and get in time. If that urethra is allowed to rest, it will actually structure down as well. So identifying the whole segment, adhering to specialization, specializing into healthy tissue is one thing. And the skin in your, your, your urinary tract does enjoy, you know, an attrition rate and that structure will reform, it will contract and re -scar. So again, using, using the buccal graft when tissue transfer is required has been excellent. And again, accurately saving the structure is usually of prime importance in those patients as well.